We read these words in Matthew 26, verses 6 through 16. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she had poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Good morning, and welcome to the Vine Fellowship Church in Copley, Ohio, on this the fourth Sunday in Lent. My name is Mark Rupert, and I'm the pastor of the church, and we are glad you decided to worship with us today. If you're a member, a friend, or a new friend, we're glad you're with us and we'd love to hear from you during the service, so please share your comments. And also, if you don't have a church home, please consider us your home. And also, if you're in need of pastoral care, please call me here at the church. I have two announcements today. The first is our denomination's one great hour of sharing. During the season of Lent, our denomination collects this special offering. And so our community ministry mission team, along with our session, invites you to prayerfully consider giving to this worthy offering. The offering provides relief from natural disasters, food for the hungry, and support for the poor and the oppressed. Please send your offering to the church, and on your check in the memo section, please write one great hour of sharing. The other announcement is our per capita news. Each year, every Presbyterian church is asked to pay a per capita for every active church member. Per capita is, is a fundamental way in which all of the nearly 10,000 congregations and mid-councils of the Presbyterian Church USA connect, participate, and share in the work of the wider church. Please prayerfully consider contributing $32 as this is a line item on our church budget. Now please join me in our call to worship. God summons us to wake up and see. Light has come to lead us to all that is good. Our eyes have been opened to God's goodness. We seek to live as children of light. God sees beyond our outward appearance. God knows the intent of our hearts. We are here to find out what is pleasing to God. We want to know what is right and true. God listens to all who worship sincerely. Praise God with openness and obedience. We seek to know and follow God's will. This is a day to do the works of God. Let us worship God.
With our limited insight, we often misjudge people and situations. Our view of things may be far from the way God sees the circumstances of our lives and our relationships. Individually and together, we are involved in sin that cuts us off from what God expects of us. Let us admit our need for forgiveness. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Great God, Great Shepherd, we thank you for finding us and bringing us to this time of prayer. We have wandered far from the paths of integrity, justice, and peace that you have set before us. We are ashamed of some things we do when we think no one will find out. We are quick to judge others and to excuse ourselves. We want to decide who is acceptable to you and who is not. Surely we persuade ourselves. You prefer people like us and not those who appear, believe, or act differently. Even as we say those words, we know we are not in tune with your way. Forgive us, we pray, and help us to change. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of hope. The goodness and mercy of God are always available to us. We can receive these gifts when we are truly sorry for our sin and open to the riches of God's grace. When we let God touch our unseeing eyes, we gain new insights and can begin to view others with the compassion of Christ. Let us accept with joy the healing we are offered right here, right now. Amen.
with me. O God of light and life, through the ages your messengers have proclaimed that your day is at hand. Creation has spoken of your care and your never-ending love. You sent the Christ into the midst of humanity so that there could be no denying your concern for our well-being. You are the God who restores that which your people have destroyed. You are the God that mends brokenness and brings wholeness in the midst of fractured relationships. You make wars to cease and you establish peace among the, the nations. We hear your word for our time and we give thanks for your unending pursuit of righteousness. O oh God, send forth your light so that all may inherit your eternal life. Reform those who disregard your creation. Give them a sense of how all things should mesh together. You have instilled in us such an awesome power, God. Grant us humility to acknowledge your gift and exercise it humanely. Make us aware of how fragile life truly is and that any one part cannot be abused without affecting the whole. Help us to work toward a right order of creation, whatever our role and whatever our status. We pray this day for those whose relationships are in disarray. Keep us from premature or harming judgments that only enhance their pain. Help us to offer reconciling words which can be helpful and make our presence beneficial in their overcoming their loneliness. God, you have taught us what it means to love one another. You have shown how inter interdependent all creation ought to be. And so therefore, keep us mindful of our mutual support that we can offer to one another. And make us, O oh God, willing to bear one another's burdens as though it were our own. We pray this day for those from our church and for those who are friends of our church. We pray for me and Pete, Stephanie, Jacob, Frank, John and Eileen, William, Danielle. We pray for Evelyn and her daughter Nancy. We remember our friends, Fred and Pat, Shirley, Doug, Sue Ann, Gary, John, and John, who recently died of COVID-19. Be with us as a country as we rise out of this time of COVID-19. Be with us as a country as we have seen a rise in racial discrimination against a variety of people, more recently Asians. We pray as the trial over the death of George Floyd looms. God, we pray for peace in our land. We pray that people will be more tolerant of one another. We pray for the leaders of our land to work together for the people. We pray for those who are trying to put their lives back together in parts of our country after, de after devastations because of weather issues and other concerns. We pray for people who are trying to get the vaccine. And we think of the underprivileged people who are also trying desperately to get it. We pray for all the lives that have been lost through COVID-19. And we think of the health care workers who continue to minister to the sick. Be with us, God, as we continue on this spiritual journey of Lent, as we make our way to Palm Sunday and Holy Week, Good Friday, and that glorious Resurrection Day. In the midst of all that we have been through and still are going through, remind us, O oh Lord, that we are people of the Resurrection who find our hope in Jesus. For we pray all these things remembering as Jesus taught his disciples to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
morning's scripture reading comes to us from the Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter, beginning at verse 13, going through verse 22. Hear the word of God. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And may God add his blessing to this, the reading and the hearing from his holy and precious word. For this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, open up our ears and help us to listen. Lord, open up our eyes so that we truly might see Jesus. Amen. Well, it's only six, six days away, and the date and the time for this welcomed event is March 20th, and it's 5.37 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, when all of it begins. Do you know what important event I'm thinking about? Well, to get technical, in the Northern Hemisphere, the March equinox, a.k.a. spring e equinox and vernal equinox, it occurs when the sun crosses the equator line, heading north in the sky. This event marks the start of spring, spring in the northern half of the globe. After this particular day, March 20th, the northern hemisphere begins to be tilted more towards the sun, resulting in increased daylight hours and warming temperatures. So now you can start counting down the days until March the 20th, the first day of spring. But let me ask you, do you remember how spring was a year ago? It was the Monday, March 8th, 2021 edition of the Akron Beacon Journal that had as its feature story this, COVID-19, one year later, lives will be irreparably destroyed Protests fuel a lost spring and summer. Last spring was a very difficult time in our country with the virus, the racial, social, and political unrest that had swept all across this great land of ours. And yet, along with the nice weather, spring has been known to bring with it uprising in other lands. Myself, having been to Lebanon in 2016 and then to Lebanon and Syria in 2019, I've become more familiar with the springtime in that part of the world. You see, there is something called the Arab Spring that was a series of pro-democracy uprisings that enveloped several large Muslim countries, including Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, Libya, Egypt, and Bahrain. These events in these nations generally began in the spring of 2011, which then led to the name the Arab Spring. However, the political and the social impact of these popular uprisings remains significant today, years after many of them have ended. And as we know, last year in Lebanon, Beirut, there were great protests throughout the streets because of the corrupt government. 
Now, I don't know what your spring was like last March, but for my wife and I, we found ourselves, along with many others, hunkering down and working from home, obviously due to the virus. But we also were involved in watching and listening and reading about all the things that were happening all across our country. And I have to admit, it found us watching more Netflix movies just to take our mind off of all that was happening. But we actually did something else. We did some major spring cleaning in our basement. You know, I talked to a lot of people who used March and April and maybe even a few months later to do some major cleanings in their homes, whether it was their attic or their basement or their garage, because so many of us were quarantined. Well, in our passage today, we read about another major cleaning. But this cleaning takes place in the house of God. It takes place in the temple there in the holy city, Jerusalem. Now, I know this season of Lent is when you might hear many sermons being preached about Jesus' earthly ministry coming to a close and his time on earth was winding down as he was making his way to his cross there at Calvary. And I know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record Jesus' cleansing of the temple after his triumphal entry on that glorious Palm Sunday, once again near the end of his earthly ministry. But here, here in John's gospel, John has the cleansing taking place not at the end of the ministry of Jesus, but at the beginning of his ministry. And how we come to understand this is because what is written in verse 20. For verse 20 says, They they being the Jews, replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? So this cleansing of the temple in John's gospel is dated A.D. 30 at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Work of Herod's temple had been proceeding for 46 years and it was not completed until A.D. 63. And so scholars believe that the differences between these two cleansing incidences and their placement in the chronological order of Jesus' ministry makes it very reasonable that there were two cleansings and not just one. For when you think about it, John's account of the cleansing was certainly an interesting way that set the tone for Jesus beginning his ministry. I mean, what a way to begin. He started it out with a bang. Jesus, as verse 12 indicates, has just been to Capernaum for a few days with his disciples, his mother, and his brothers. Now, the disciples have not been with him very long, but now, having spent some time with him, he called them together, and he then leads them to Jerusalem. Their relationship is being permanently sealed together as they go then to Jerusalem to celebrate the first Passover where he is the acknowledged Messiah. Now, prior to this visit, Jesus would have seen Jerusalem and the temple many times. He would have seen similar sights and sounds, the same that he saw on this occasion, but in all those previous occasions, he never responded. However, this time is different. He has come to Jerusalem as Messiah, and he will fulfill what the prophet Malachi said in Malachi 3, where it says, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and he will purify the descendants of Levi. Now, Levi, Levi was the priestly tribe of Israel, and they were in charge of taking care of the sanctuary, the temple there in Jerusalem. And so Jesus comes to the temple at the Passover time, and he finds people selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers are doing all their business right there in the temple courtyard. Now, this was undoubtedly the outer court of the Gentiles, not the temple building. 
And it was probably the custom of selling sacrificial animals and exchanging various types of money for the temple coinage to help all these pilgrims that were flooding into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, and there they could buy whatever they were going to sacrifice or make a temple offering. Now, it's interesting that the priest only accepted Tyrian coins because of their purity of their silver. And so by the time that Jesus comes along in 30 AD, this practice had become a huge business for the priests to the point that they had replaced the spiritual worship there in that courtyard during the Passover season. And instead of worshiping going on there, they made it a noisy, busy bazaar. So this made it impossible then for the Gentiles to worship there because of all the business that was going on. The Gentiles lost their place of worshiping the one true God. The priest had set up tables for the money changers only for about three weeks leading up to the Passover, but that was enough. So how does Jesus respond? Well, he becomes enraged and in righteous indignation, he drives them out. Jesus gave the temple a good house cleaning. Jesus was now putting his father's house back in order. So this is a bit of the background of what we read about in our passage today. Now, remember that I said that John records this cleansing at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, while Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the cleansing after Jesus' Palm Sunday entrance into the holy city. And I mentioned that there is an argument for two cleansings rather than for one. If you go and read the other accounts in the other three Gospels, there's a great deal of difference in these events between Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John's account. There's a different Old Testament scripture passage that is referred to in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Instead of it being Malachi 3, as we find in our passage, Jesus in those other three accounts refers to Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 7, 11. Also, there is no mention of a whip, and Jesus makes a different claim about himself. At the end of his ministry, Jesus spoke out sharply against the nation of Israel when he said this, Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives. Then he went to the upper room to celebrate the Passover feast. Then he was betrayed. And finally he was crucified. And this is what we read in the other three gospel accounts. But John's account is of the first of two spring cleanings. Now the merchants and the money changers back in Jesus' day, they viewed the temple court as an opportunity for financial gain. Yes, they were providing a service to all the people who came for the Passover. They were providing for those pilgrims animals for sacrifice, or they were exchanging foreign currency into the acceptable currency for the temple and for the offerings. But they abused the service. In Mark 11, verse 17, Jesus says that they had turned the temple into a den of robbers. The temple had lost its intended original purpose. And so Jesus' actions that day was seen as a major threat, a threat to the financial arrangements for the sacrificial system that was set up. And when he cleansed out the temple that day, he had declared war on the hypocritical religious leaders of his day. And this would eventually lead to his death. For when you think about it, Jesus' zeal for God's house was his demise. Jesus came to cleanse. And yet Jesus came to take on an even more difficult cleansing than than the one that we read about in our passage today. Jesus came into this world to cleanse 
our hearts to make us whole. For you see, it was King David who prayed in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. And so let me ask, how will we clean our own hearts? How will we do spring cleaning during this Lenten season in order for us to get our own houses in order? I mean, if I have to be brutally honest, our houses are too dirty. There is no way that you or I could perform any kind of self-cleaning. There is absolutely no cleanser, no detergent, no solution that is tough enough, that is strong enough to do the job. And any type of cleaning that we do is always, it's always going to be more superficial. Because listen to what Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 25. Hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. It was the great reformer Martin Luther he attempted to do his own self-cleaning. As a matter of fact, he even used a whip on himself. But his self-abuse did not remove one single stain. No, you see, there is only one way. Only one way that you and I can be cleansed. There is only one way a legitimate spring cleaning can occur in our lives in order to keep our houses in order and that is through the cleansing that only comes through Jesus Christ. 1 John 1 verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This purification came about not by a whip being laid to your back or mine, but to his, to the back of Jesus this cleansing came about through the blood that he shed on our behalf so that we might be clean, that we might be cleansed. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. A house must be cleaned if it's going to be a place where God can dwell. And Jesus Christ has cleansed our hearts from sin with a cleansing that only he could do. You know, whenever we think of the house of God, a place of worship, unfortunately, we think of a building. That sometimes is the first place we go, a building. And yet the real temples, well, they are our bodies human beings and their bodies made up of body, mind, and spirit. This, this body of mind is where God and we're in your body, where God has created a place where he can dwell and live there permanently. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? You see, the wonderful thing about Jesus is that he cares about our temples. He cares about all the inward clutter and confusion and sinfulness that may be there. And you know what? He will not make peace with it. Verse 17 of our passage tells us that as the disciples watched Jesus cleanse the temple, there was a verse, a verse from Psalm 69 that went flashing through their minds. For that psalm describes the suffering that the Messiah was to experience. Psalm 69, 9 says, It is zeal for your house, that has consumed me. And as a result, zeal burned Jesus up. It ignited him to the point that day that he responded with that cleansing. They began to understand that God doesn't compromise with evil. 
the fact that Jesus desires our temples to be pure, our temples to be holy, our temples to be acceptable to God, and he will not compromise with evil. And there is a paradox here. For when we read through John's gospel, we read how anyone can come to Christ, no matter who they are, no matter what they have been like, no matter their background, no matter how much evil they have committed. Murderers, liars, prostitutes, swindlers, drunkards, bitter people, religious hypocrites, proud, self-righteous, and self-sufficient snobs, anyone who recognized there was something wrong in their life, that something had possessed them and brought hurt and pain and sorrow, they could come to Jesus. Because Jesus, Jesus wants the best for us. Jesus wants us to be whole. And maybe, maybe for the first time, the disciples realized that if you come to Jesus, get ready. Get ready because he is not going to leave you the way that you are. He is not going to leave you the way that you were. Jesus is not going to settle for extortion, compromise, clutter, greed, whatever may be putting garbage and clutter and defiling and corrupting the temple courts of our lives. Jesus wants change. Jesus wants permanent, healthy, godly change. Anytime you do any good old-fashioned spring cleaning, there is always, I mean, there is always the possibility that over time, you start to let things collect again. And that once clean basement or attic or garage becomes, well, filled up with clutter all over again. I'm sure as the weather is breaking, Margaret and I will undoubtedly start another project on some part of the house. The garage has already been overtaken with clutter. And the garage, it's lost some of its intended purpose. I know because I pull my car in there every day. When Jesus cleansed the temple, Jesus wanted that cleansing to last. The temple was a house of prayer. The money changers and swindlers were gone because he had cast them all out. But they would return. Jesus commanded them, stop making. They were probably back there the very next day. We know they were back. Because three years later, Jesus performed the second cleansing of the temple after he had ridden triumphantly into the holy city that first Palm Sunday. You know, abuses have a way of creeping their way back in. Something else was going to need to be changed, not just the condition of the courthouse or the courtyard of the Gentiles. And that's why Jesus preached and healed between these two cleansings, the one in our passage today and the one that we read about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel. That's why Jesus taught and he touched the lives and the hearts of those who wanted their lives to be changed. And Jesus changed a lot of lives. And he's still in the business of changing lives. He told of the love of God that endures forever. So that when people mess up, when people sin, they could come back to God for cleansing and renewal. For our God is the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance. And well, you get the picture. Jesus was consumed with zeal for his father's house that day. Oh, may God give us the same kind of zeal when it comes to our lives, when it comes to our hearts. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God. Don't wait till spring. Don't wait till the season of Lent. Don't wait until life is so out of control and so messed up. And yet, let me say, Lent can be a time 
a time for us to get our spiritual house in order by relinquishing our hearts to his control. It's time now for spring cleaning, a cleaning that only Jesus can do in a temple that is reserved for him. Amen. Thanks for joining with us in worship today, and we hope you'll come back next Lord's Day as we continue to make our way through this season of Lent. Please reach out to others. I know that people are now starting to be able to get together because of getting the vaccine, but, but there's still a lot of people that don't have the vaccine yet if they decide to get it. And so I ask you to call and reach out. Love someone this week. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>